Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are picking up with lesson two tonight. God tells us about himself, uh, then getting into his creation and providential care of his creation. But before we get to that, let's take a look at the worksheet for lesson one. And we'll do this like last time. I'll uh, just go around and uh, answer the multiple choice questions. I'll take number one. Uh, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the Old Testament was written before Jesus came to earth and the New Testament after he came to earth. When we say the Bible was inspired by God, we mean that it... Oh, sorry. Uh, is totally God's word from beginning to end because God chose each word in it? Yep. Number three, the Bible is God's word. Number four, the primary purpose of the Bible is to make us wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We use the Bible properly when we read it and study it daily and gladly, asking God blessings and wisdom. Number six, the Bible was written by the prophets, apostles, and evangelists. Evangelists. Yep. When the people in number six wrote the Bible, where did they receive their words? They receive them from the Holy Spirit. In Deuteronomy 4, 2 and Revelation 22, God forbids us to add or subtract anything from his word. And the New Testament was written in Greek. The two main doctrines or teachings of the Bible are the law and the gospel. When we study the law in the Bible, we learn uh, what God demands of people and how we have sinned against him and need a savior. Number 12. When we read the gospel in the Bible, we learn about God's love and salvation for us sinners through Jesus Christ. And number 13, if the law makes us aware of our sins, as Romans 3.20 tells us, then it also tells us we need a Savior from sin. Any questions on any of those? Okay. Uh, the true and false, the first one, all the historical facts in the Bible are true. That's true. Only the religious things in the Bible are true, false. Only the four gospel letters are inspired by God, false. And everything the Bible says is true. That would be true. The last one here, put an X by those statements uh, that fit uh, each concept, and there may be more than one, and it's pretty obvious how many there are in each one because they say it. So number one, mark off the five defining characteristics of the law. On the left-hand side, the second one down, tells us what to do and not to do. The next one, written in both our hearts and the Bible. And the next one, makes us aware or conscious of our sin. And then on the right-hand side, the last two. It curses us and shows us we need a Savior. Anything there? Number two, mark off the four defining characteristics of the gospel. On the left-hand side, the second one down, written in the Bible only. And then the last two, motivates us to live for Jesus and forgives sins. On the right-hand side, the top one, tells us what God did for us. Any questions? No. Okay. Then let's get into lesson two. And while I get things started off here, if you want, you can open your Bible to Genesis chapter one. And you can pretty much leave it there for about the entire lesson tonight because we're going to be spending uh, a lot of time in Genesis one or coming back to it and or Genesis chapter two. Uh, but uh, first of all, over 95% of the world's population believes in a higher power. But does that mean that they worship the same God we worship? In this lesson, we will look at how the Bible describes the one true God. Uh, but starting off with a biblical assumption, uh, we're going to read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, would you mind doing that for us? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. These are the very first words of the Bible, of God's word to mankind. And what we see here is, at the very start, he introduces himself uh, as, as uh, the one who created the heavens and 
the earth. The question, what knowledge does the author, God, assume the reader already possesses? A little bit of a tricky one, maybe. In the beginning, that there is nothing, maybe? Okay, I mean, yeah, that that's not, I don't know if that's necessarily the case, if uh, the, the uh, writer assumes that, because he goes on to tell them that. Um, like I said, this is a tricky question. He assumes that the reader already knows that there is a God. Now, you don't need to write the whole thing up there, just uh, that little sentence there. But uh, what I put there in brackets, just that, that God is not, he doesn't start off by saying, going through all these sorts of logical arguments and explanations to prove his existence. Like, hi, everybody, I'm God, and, and here's how you can know that I'm here, even though you might not be able to, to actually see me. Um, he doesn't get into that. He just says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's an assumption there that we know that there is somebody who created everything. Interesting question, though, when we uh, look at Genesis 1, verse 1. What is the very first thing that God created? And almost everybody gets this question wrong. Heavens and earth. Wrong. <laughs> That's what, you know, some people will say heavens. I'll say, nope. Earth, nope. Heavens and earth, nope. In the beginning. What's beginning? Time. Time. Yeah. Time is the very first thing that God created. Because remember, uh, every sort of animate object exists in four dimensions. If, you, if you've ever seen the movie Back to the Future, yeah. Marty McFly and, and Doc Brown always tells Marty, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. And uh, uh, the four dimensions are length, width, height, and time. Uh, and time is the very first thing that God created. So God then exists outside of time. Okay, part one. How can someone know that there is a God? Uh, Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And so you have this language here of, of different words for speech. Uh, day after day, uh, you know, they, they uh, pour forth speech night after night, they proclaim knowledge, and, and so on and so forth. It, it goes on and on with different words to talk that, that all have to do with communication. And so the heavens communicate God's glory. The skies, again, communicate uh, that they are his work. Like when you look up into the heavens at nighttime, you're out in the country, and wow, you know, you see all those stars up there. Uh, read Romans 1, verse 20, please. In fact, God's invisible characteristics, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world because they are understood from the things he made. As a result, people are without excuse. Without excuse, meaning there's no excuse for not knowing that there is a God uh, because of uh, what we see around us uh, testify to the eternal power and divine nature of God. Hebrews 3, 4, For every house is built by someone, but God is the one who built everything. How do we know that somebody built a house? How do we know that they just don't randomly appear out of nowhere or assemble themselves out of nowhere? Uh, usually you can see it be done. All right, you could probably see somebody doing it, yep. Um, now, could you build a house? Personally? No, probably no. not. <laughs> I couldn't either. Uh, you know, why, why wouldn't you be able to build a house? I just don't have probably the knowledge to. Exactly. A house has intelligence in its design, doesn't it? I mean, if I were to take this watch, okay, and the watch is working, it's running right now. If I were to take it apart uh, into all of its individual components, put it into a box, close the box, let the box sit there, or maybe even, you know what, I'll manipulate. How about that? I'll shake it up a little bit to let, get the pieces moving, give them a little bit of help, because normally they wouldn't. I open the box, and the watch is not only assembled, but it's running. What are the chances? Nothing. 
Yeah, it, it's not going to happen. And, and that, that's because you need an intelligence to put the watch together to not only assemble it, but also to make sure that it's running. There's an intelligence in the design. That doesn't just happen by random happen chance. And so uh, of the two ways that all people can tell there is a God, the first one is by nature. You've got that comic there on the side there and on the screen and in your packet of, you know, God, if you're real, show me a sign. And the guy's just standing there looking at nature like, I'm waiting. I mean, if we know these things from a house or a watch, how much more so the human eye? How much more so DNA, which I'm right, is like six, six billion um, pieces of code long. Just incredibly, incredibly complex and intricate and in how everything works together. Um, it, it screams intelligence in its design and wisdom that God made everything. So nature is one of the the clear, surefire ways of knowing that there is an intelligence, a, a, a very powerful being out there who put all of this together and set the laws in place to make everything run more or less smoothly. There's one other way, though, that we can know that there is a God. Romans 2, 14 and 15. In fact, whenever Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires. Even though they do not have the law, they are a law for themselves. They demonstrate the work of the law that is written in their hearts, since their conscience always bears witness. As their thoughts go back and forth, at times accusing, or at times even defending them. All right, so notice there, uh, there's a lot that we could unpack in this passage about what it's talking about with Gentiles who do not have the law, and yet they do what the law requires. Um, the Jews, remember, at Mount Sinai, they were given the written law and the Ten Commandments in the Bible. Um, the Gentiles, who were the non-Jewish people, they didn't have that, uh, really, until uh, New Testament times when the church began to spread, especially among the Gentiles. Uh, but those Gentiles still were doing by nature, those things that the law required. How is that? How is it that they knew that it's wrong to murder, that it's wrong to steal, that it's wrong to take another man's woman and, and commit adultery? How did they know that these things were wrong? Well, Paul says it's because the law was also written on their hearts. That, uh, that there's a natural knowledge of this law. And the conscience, the human conscience, bears witness to that law written upon us. Uh, so uh, the second way we know that there's a God is by our conscience. Um, who put that law there? That doesn't just happen by random happen chance or accident. Somebody had to have, have put that into us. Uh, looking at the bold type there, right underneath where you just wrote, by observing nature, we can tell that God is kind, wise, eternal, powerful, and divine. Through our consciences, which bear witness to the law of God, written on our hearts at creation, we can tell that God is just and holy and will hold us accountable for our attitudes, thoughts, words, and actions. So you know, not only do we know about God from our conscience because of that law in our hearts, but we also then know a little bit about God too uh, through both nature and conscience, but in regard to conscience, he is a just God, a God of, of rules, a God of order, a God of laws. But looking a little bit at those terms uh, in more depth, uh, the first one there is that God is eternal, meaning that he's without beginning and without end. And it's interesting, you think of, uh, most people when they think of eternal it means that they never die. Well, well that, that is part of it, but in God's case, it means there's no beginning either. Now, we, we can't grasp or understand how can it be that uh, God can have no beginning and no end, because we, our only experience and understanding is within the confines of time. And, and so we can't picture a, 
uh, of being who exists outside of it. Uh, the second one is term is divine, which means possessing the characteristics of God. Now we call this knowledge uh, that we glean from nature and our conscience the natural knowledge of God. Uh, the natural knowledge of God just as a term there that everything that we can know about God from nature and from our conscience. So the natural knowledge can't tell us a good number of things. The problem though is ultimately that it is insufficient, that it is lacking in um, some absolutely necessary key areas. And um, that's what we're going to look at in this next section. Uh, the next passage, Acts 17, 22, I'll read. Then Paul stood up in front of the council of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which had been inscribed to an unknown God. Now what you worship as unknown, this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Uh, just pausing there for a second before we get to the first answer here to number one. Uh, the ancient Greeks, as you know, they had their whole pantheon of gods like Zeus, Hermes, Athena, and so on. Uh, but why do you think they would have had a statue here, or an altar, uh, dedicated to an unknown god? Because it was like the natural knowledge? They yeah, their natural knowledge was, was telling them something. Uh, they were afraid that they might have left a god out somewhere and that they weren't giving him acknowledgement or credit. And this was kind of their way of hedging their bets, of covering their bases. Like, oh crap, you know what? Sorry, we didn't mean to offend you. So here's a statue or an altar that uh, just in case, okay? So hopefully you don't get too upset and offended by us. Uh, that, that's kind of what they were doing. But what that shows is the answer to uh, number one, the first answer, um, what important knowledge about God are we not able to obtain from nature or conscience? We don't know who the true God is or what he's like. Now we do know, you know, the, maybe some of the generics of what he's like, but the specifics about him Nature doesn't tell us, nor does our conscience. On the next passage, Acts 16. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down, trembling in front of Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Okay, um, really interesting story here. The Apostle Paul and his traveling companion Silas had wrongfully been imprisoned. I won't get into the whole backstory of that. I'll take a little bit of explaining. But uh, they've been terribly beaten and whipped, thrown into prison, and you, obviously they, they can't be feeling all that good. It's not like, okay, the government beat them up and then sent them to the hospital to recover before throwing them in the slammer. No, we just skipped the hospital part and put them into maximum security. Well, during the course of the night, we hear that they were singing hymns and, and praying to God and whatnot. And obviously, you know, they're not just doing this to themselves. Others are hearing them. The other people in the jail, even the jailer himself was hearing it. Well, for whatever dumb reason, the jailer decided to take a little siesta late at night and he fell asleep while on duty. Big no-no for Romans. Big, 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 big no-no. And there is an earthquake while he's sleeping. And this earthquake is violent enough that it, it thrusts all of the cell doors open. And when he wakes up, he sees the cell doors open and he thinks, oh crap, all of the prisoners have just gone. And you know what the punishment for a Roman soldier was who allowed a prisoner to escape under his care? Probably whipped. Sometimes they were lucky if that's what it was. Basically, the punishment was whatever the imprisoned was going to be punished with. And we know that some of those prisoners then were 
on death row because this soldier takes his sword and he's about to run himself through. But the Apostle Paul yells out, don't do it, we're all still here. So the guy immediately gets, you know, the uh, calls for lights, he gets all the, the uh, prisoners secured. He can breathe a sigh of relief. He's safe. And yet, even after that moment, he rushes in, falls down, trembling in front of Paul and Silas, and says, what must I do to be saved? And there's, it, there's a lot of things that we can learn from this. First of all, again, he doesn't know who the true God is or what he's like, obviously. His question shows that. But the second thing that his question shows is an assumption. He assumes that he has to do something in order to be saved. That he has to live up to some standard or meet some obligation or requirement. Uh, that is what is implied in his question. Now let's take a look at the next passage, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. What no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no human mind has conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. So, what God has prepared for those who love him, meaning specifically what he's done for us in Jesus, no, I, you know, no mind has come up with this. And uh, I, I think that the, the previous story really shows that. Because the natural human inkling or inclination is that, okay, if I'm going to get to heaven, I have to do something. I have to live up to a certain uh, code or, you know, um, you know, rise above whatever the bar is set at. Um, I have to do something, essentially. And thus, yeah, no human mind would even conceive of, okay, no, this is God's plan of salvation. Believe in Jesus. And that gets us to the second weakness of the natural knowledge of God, that it doesn't tell us about a Savior from sin. The jailer knew that there is a God. He knew that he was accountable to him. He's trembling. He's terrified. But that natural knowledge did not tell him about Jesus. Now, some people will say that they feel closest to God when they are out walking in nature. And there's no doubt, you know, you're going to witness God's uh, power, his majesty, um, his artwork on display, especially like in the fall when all the leaves are turning beautiful colors and so on. Uh, you know, God is a master artist. And you, you see those things. But nature is never, ever, ever going to draw you any closer than just that basic bit about God. Only through Jesus do we enter into a right relationship with him. Only through Jesus do we really know who the true God is and what he's like. Um, and so, looking at the bold type there, that leads me to that. Although the natural knowledge of God is both insufficient for salvation and fails to teach us the way of salvation, it is useful in that it leads people to reach out for God and find him and leaves us with no excuse for rejecting God on Judgment Day. However, for a truly satisfying knowledge of God, we need to look somewhere other than nature or our conscience. And that gets us then to part three. How can someone know about the true God? Read John 1.18, please. No one has ever seen God the only begotten Son, who is close to the Father's side, that is Jesus, has made him known. Jesus, the only begotten Son of the Father, has made the Father known. The next passage, John 14, Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that is enough for us. Have I been with you so long, Jesus answered, and you still do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? So as I already pretty much answered here with number one, who reveals God the Father to us? Well, that's Jesus, the Son of God. And he really did that during his earthly ministry. 
Um, because in, in his earthly ministry, we see through Jesus God's burning desire for justice, but also his burning desire for mercy. Uh, both of these strong personalities and desires are personified in Jesus, and they converge and are resolved at the cross. God says, I must have justice for sins. I cannot be just and holy unless I have it. He also says, I love the sinner, I want to forgive him. How does he reconcile that? He does it at the cross. Now the Bible tells us a little bit more about God and gives us some specific details about God. Uh, read Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. All right. We'll be reading John 3.16 in a moment, but uh, what John 3.16 is to us Christians, probably the most familiar passage in the Bible to Christians, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 is to Jews. Uh, so much so that when I was studying Hebrew in college, I was required to memorize it in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Uh, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, interesting thing there, when it says the Lord is one. Hebrew actually has two different words for the word one. One of those words is like an absolute singularity, the, the singleness. Another, the other one, can have the idea of a composite unity, of more than one uh, individuals coming together to form one body or whatever. And um, for example, when God creates Eve, and uh, Adam says, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, Isha, because she was taken out of man, Ish. And for this reason, a, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. So two individuals, one flesh. Composite unity. That is the, the word one being used here. The one that has that idea of composite unity. And I think that's very important when we consider... Matthew 28, 19, some familiar words. Therefore, go and gather disciples from all nations by baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you've got the three persons there. Again, nature does not give us that sort of specific identity about God. We hear about it there in the Bible. And then John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Again, something nature doesn't tell us. God's great plan for us. So question number two, to fill in the blanks. Unlike nature and conscience, the Bible tells us who the true God is and what he's like. It also tells us about Jesus our Savior from sin. And Jesus really is the defining aspect of the Christian faith and the, the element that sets the Christian faith apart from all other world religions. And that gets to number three, that at their core, all world religions, except Christianity, really are the same. They are. Because all world religions say that you must do something in order to be saved, uh, or to go to the good afterlife, whether it's heaven, reincarnation, whatever. Uh, it makes no difference if it's Islam, Buddhism, etc. Do this and you will live. Christianity is different. Christianity doesn't say do. Christianity says done. Done by Jesus. And that's because, as we'll look at more when we get to the lesson about Jesus, Jesus kept God's law for us and died for our sins, so we don't have to keep the law's impossible demands. Uh, because God says, be holy or be perfect, because I am holy or perfect. Now, that's not to say that Christianity doesn't say you don't have to do things, period. Um, 
No, Christianity does say yes, by all means, uphold the law of God, but not to use it as your bargaining chip with God. Okay, pause it really quick. Any questions so far? Mm -hmm. Part four, the true God is triune. Now, in the last section, we read Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. This and other Bible passages teach us that there is only one God. However, the Bible also teaches us something remarkable about the nature of God, that he is three persons in one Godhead. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the words Trinity and Triune, by the way, you see in the footnote, don't actually occur on the pages of Scripture. And some people, like Jehovah's Witnesses, will point that out just to say, see, the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. Well, you know, the, the Bible does teach it. Uh, these are just terms that the church uses to help explain what the Bible teaches. Uh, but this is an example of a truth that is beyond our comprehension. Because think about this, you know, what's one plus one plus one? Three. No, wrong. One plus one plus one is not three. One plus one plus one is one. What? <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? But that's what the Bible is saying. Three persons, one God. One plus one plus one equals one. How, how does that work? I don't understand it. Now, if you can explain it to me, you can have my seat, and I'll go uh, gladly take yours and, and, and sit at your feet and learn all day. Um, you know, again, we can try to describe the truth, illustrate it, um, but uh, we will never fully understand how God can be triune. In fact, any attempt to illustrate it by saying that God is like a three-leaf clover, well, that's a, a false teaching called partialism, saying that each person of the Trinity only covered or is made up of one-third of the divine. Um, and then there's other illustrations uh, like uh, water, uh, where you got water, ice, and uh, vapor, or, or uh, you know, steam, and that's uh, modalism, uh, a false teaching where God is, they're saying God is just revealing himself as different individuals at different times, and so at one point revealing himself as the Father, and another time as the Son, and another time the Holy Spirit, but there are uh, moments in the Bible where all three members of the Trinity are all present uh, individually at the same time in a certain place. So anyway, uh, there are other such truths in God's word like this that we, we can't understand. And we call these teachings articles of faith. Uh, in other words, we trust what he's told us even if we don't understand. And so uh, just throwing those two terms up on the screen for you, First of all, triune means three persons in one Godhead. And then articles of faith, teachings we don't fully understand, but we trust are true because God says they are true. And as we heard last week, the Bible gives us a lot of confidence in, knowing, uh, in showing us how it is God's word. And so we can be confident that it is God's word. Uh, we might not understand everything the Bible teaches. Uh, we may not, we might be able to um, comprehend what it's saying, but we may not be able to apprehend. In other words, uh, that, or maybe I'm getting those words mixed up. Uh, you know, we can we can understand. Okay, this is what it's saying, but we're not necessarily going to fully grasp it. Uh, you know, with a full understanding. But my understanding of the Bible is not a prerequisite for my believing it. Uh, if God were small enough for us. Uh, to understand he wouldn't be big enough to be worshipped. There are certain, obviously going to be things that are beyond our ability to understand about God. That just comes with the job description of being God. Okay, so although the doctrine of the Trinity wasn't fully revealed until the New Testament, there were hints of it already in the very first chapter of the Bible. Here are two examples from the Old Testament, uh, one from the very first chapter, Notice it says, then God said, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And then again, Isaiah 6, verse 8, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? My question there for, the, for you on these two passages is, what seems grammatically incorrect or at least inconsistent about these passages. 
English question. God said, let us make man in our image. So yeah. you let me. Ah, me, let me make man in my image and my likeness. Yeah, but he says us. God, or me, what's the difference between me and us? It's singular versus singular versus plural. God, is that singular or plural? Not singular. Singular, then in the next passage, Lord, is singular or plural? Singular. Again, yeah. And you've got a mixture here of singular and plural. Uh, plural pronouns. In fact, what's interesting there in Isaiah 6, you have a singular pronoun first, and then later on, you've got the plural pronoun. Why does God do that? Well, he's kind of giving us a little hint about himself. That yes, even though there's one God, there's multiple persons in the Godhead. The next passage, number 6, 24 to 26. Could you read that, please? Yes. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. Two. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Three. A threefold blessing. In the next passage, Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. A little bit of a subtle nod again to the Trinity. But then you have the most explicit passage which we heard earlier. Uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Notice each of those words or names, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all referring back to one word, name. And what do you notice about that word, name? There's three arrows. Yeah, there are. There is three, but name is written in what? Lowercase. The singular. Yeah, it's written in the singular. So one name, but all of these, you know, you look at and the, and the, the Greek really shows it. The English shows it too. Uh, unfortunately, some people uh, choose not to recognize that, uh, but. Especially in the Greek, the language that this was originally written in, it's very clear. The, uh, the word father modifies the word name. The word son modifies the word name. The word the, uh, the Holy Spirit modifies the word name. They all refer back to name. They all are part of this, or, or uh, are of this name of God. And yet not three gods, but one God. And each one fully God. Again, how is that? I don't understand. Second Corinthians 13, if you could read that. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, i.e. the God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So who are the three persons then of the Trinity? Father, Father Son, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, yeah. So then jumping right away to question two while you write that. Uh, when we say that we have a triune God, we are saying that we worship one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We do not worship three gods. Now the concept of a three in one God, again, as I've been stressing, is impossible for our minds to grasp, yet we believe it because it's what God's Word teaches. We use the word triune, since it conveniently expresses this incomprehensible truth. Tria means three, and unis, or uno, means one. The following diagram here on the screen is a way of picturing our triune God. It's also in your packet. It illustrates how each person of the Trinity is named in Scripture, has divine characteristics, and does things only God could do. It shows that each person of the Trinity is distinct from one another, yet all are God, the one true God. This diagram can serve as the answer to our question, what do we mean when we say we have a triune God? And so what you see there going along the outside, starting with the Father, the Father is not the Son. 
meaning it is not the same individual revealing himself in a different way. The Son, in much the same way, then, is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are three distinct individuals. However, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet, not three gods, but one God. Now, one thing to keep in mind there is the note right below the diagram in your packet that if we deny one person of the Trinity, we deny God completely. Because Jesus has said that uh, through his Apostle John that no one who denies the Son has the Father. And so if you deny one of those members of the Trinity, you're really denying God himself because that is God. Part 5. God's nature and characteristics. In nature and through conscience, we learn that God is kind, wise, eternal, and divine, and that he is a God of justice. However, there are many more characteristics about God that are revealed to us more clearly in Scripture. And we've got just a smattering of terms here. First of all, that God is omnipotent, that he's all-powerful or almighty. Uh, the word omnis is Latin for all, potent, meaning powerful. Uh, the next one, omniscient, meaning God is all-knowing, that he knows all things. Uh, you have the word science in there, meaning uh, knowledge or to know. And then the third one, omnipresent, that God is always present, that he's everywhere all the time. And there are obviously Bible passages which can support these if, if you are in need of looking at them. Uh, going on from there into the next slide, God is holy, that is, he's perfect or without sin. Uh, the word holy also has the idea of being set apart or distinct, separate. Uh, and God really is holy in that sense, in that he is set apart from everything. And then last of all, God is a spirit, meaning that he does not possess a physical body. That leads us then into uh, part six, the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Now in Romans 10, verse 10, the Apostle Paul states that it is with the mouth that a person confesses. Confessing what we believe is a natural response of saving faith. One way to confess what we believe is by means of a creed. Now a creed is just simply a statement of belief. And uh, the early Christian church had creeds. In fact, some of those creeds can be found in the pages of the New Testament. Uh, but following the time of the apostles uh, over the centuries that, that came, uh, there were eventually uh, three what are called ecumenical creeds. Uh, ecumenical, just a word meaning that it pertains to the whole Christian church. And like I said, these have been around since ancient times. First of all, the Apostles' Creed. Uh, we don't know who wrote it, but it's called the Apostles' Creed because it's a brief summary of the Christian faith as believed and taught by the Apostles. And in fact, our next several lessons are going to be um, following the basic order and outline of the Apostles' Creed. Now, the next one, the Nicene Creed, which uh, was written after, we don't know when the Apostles' Creed was written, Nicene Creed around, you could say, maybe ballpark the year thir uh, 330 AD. But that was written to defend the Bible's teaching that Jesus is true God. Uh, there was a guy named Arius who was calling that into question, and the Nicene Creed at the Council of Nicaea was written to defend that teaching. And then coming a bit later on in the uh, 5th century, in the mid uh, 400, somewhere in there, uh, not entirely certain exactly when and even where, but possibly southern France, was the Athanasian Creed, written af uh, named after St. Athanasius, who was at the Council of Nicaea. And this one was written to defend the Bible's teaching that the true God is triune. Um, there has uh, yet to be a better explanation on the doctrine of the Trinity than the Athanasian Creed. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I remember uh, several years ago now, a cousin of mine who was not Christian 
asked me a little bit about the Trinity, and I said, if you want the best explanation that there is, go to the Athanasian Creed. So, like I said, getting then uh, into the first article of the Apostles' Creed, uh, you have that there in the blue box. You won't read the whole thing. Uh, but the first part there, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and what follows then is Luther's explanation of what we mean when we say that. First passage there, Psalm 14, verse 1. Uh, please read. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Pretty ans easy answer. What does a fool say? You can just rewrite the words of the passage. <laughs> there is no God. Now, why is such a person a fool? For doubting? Yeah, why Why are they a fool? Think about what we have just learned. Uh, because there's, like, so much evidence. Yeah. It. Yeah, the natural knowledge of God. That natural knowledge is built into everybody. Now, there are some people, for various reasons, who will choose to suppress that truth. In fact, the first key term here would be uh, an atheist a person who says that there is no God, or a person who rejects God as master of his life. Um, you could define atheism either way. You've probably heard that term atheist before. It comes from the, the Greek uh, word theos, which means God. And then in Greek, when you put the a ah on the front of it, uh, it just makes it a negative. So theos, a ah, theos, or atheist, no God. Um, kind of like when we go from moral to immoral by slapping that I am on the front of moral. So the atheist, and you got those uh, little uh, illustrations there on the screen. Uh, the first one shows two uh, twin babies, twin brothers in the womb, and says, Hey brother, do you think there's a life after birth? Do you believe in mom? And the other one says, Nah, I don't believe these things. I'm an atheist. I mean... Have you ever seen mom? Because one of the arguments for athe that atheists always throw out there kind of flippantly is, well, you've never seen God. Just because you haven't seen him doesn't mean he doesn't exist. Um, and then the other one, atheism, the belief that there was nothing and nothing happened to nothing. And then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything. And then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> so, um, atheist is one term that's important here. The other one is the word agnostic, which is a person who says, I'm not sure if there is a God. It comes from the Greek word gnosko, uh, which means to know. So if you ever wonder why the word know... Uh, to know something starts off with the K, K N O W. It's right here, the G. That G, um, G N sound kind of has that K N sound in English. Uh, so, gnostic, to know, and then the ah, uh, to not know or to be uncertain. So, um, okay. So, when Christians say that I believe, uh, there in the Apostles' Creed, it means a couple of things. Number one, that we believe what we hear in God's Word. And number two, we trust God to take care of us. Another word for this is faith. And faith consists of three parts. And, I, and I'm going to give you these answers as I go to close the doors because the, the kids are making so much noise out there. But the first one is knowledge of the true God. The second one is assent. Uh, meaning, um, accept of what is written in the Bible, that is, God's Word. And then, the last one is trust in God and all His promises. Um, a lot of people have this mistaken understanding that faith simply is number one, knowledge. Like, yeah, I know there's a God, therefore I believe in God. There's more to it than that. Even the demons believe that there is a God and shudder. Uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes in his book. It's like, yeah, they know there's a God. In fact, I'll bet you dollars to donuts that he 
they know the Bible better than the both of us combined. Doesn't mean that they have faith. Faith is more than just academic head knowledge. It also has that, uh, those aspects of assent and trust. Uh, that is how scripture defines and describes faith. Okay, next couple of passages here. Uh, Malachi 2 verse 10, read please. Don't we all have one Father? Hasn't one God created us? So, number three, Christians call God our Father because he, first of all, created us. And then John 20, 17 says, Jesus told her, Do not continue to cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. The other reason is because he is the Father of Jesus. All right, now we're going to get back into our Bibles here and uh, looking directly at Genesis chapter 1 and uh, into chapter 2 as well. But um, starting off again with the first verse, could you just start reading and then I'll tell you when to stop. Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was undeveloped and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. God said... Okay, we can stop there. First question, what materials did God use to create the universe? S surface? Trick question. God used nothing. No, nothing? Oh. Nothing. Yeah. As we, if you were to keep reading, you would see God would uh, God said that there'd be light and there was light. Okay. Um, do you cook at all? <laughs> you like to cook? Uh, I like to. It's a little. Okay. What's one of your favorite things to cook? Uh, stir fry. Stir fry. Uh, nice. What sorts of. I got a really good stir fry recipe That's that right. I really, really enjoy. Yeah. Um, works good, but what, what sorts of things do you like to put in your stir fry? Uh, mushrooms, broccoli, snap peas, uh, carrots, some chicken, chicken yep. uh, soy sauce. Yep. Uh, Alright, so when you make stir fry, you take ingredients, put them in there. It's not like you just conjure this out, out of thin air. We don't have the ability to do that. See, when God made everything, he made everything out of nothing. He didn't, it wasn't even out of thin air because there was no air even. Uh, God, what we call creatio ex nihilo, meaning created out of nothing. And that's the true uniqueness about God's creating activity. Now having said that, he did use a certain instrument or tool in the creating process. Uh, we look at number two, it says according to Genesis 1, and it gives a smattering of passages there. Um, what tool did God use to form everything that is around us? Could um, I'm going to tell you what verses to read, and, uh, and then I'll have you read them. Uh, be ready, because I might uh, change things up quick. Uh, verse 3. God said, let there be light, and there was light. 6. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, and let it separate the water from the water. 9. God said, let the waters... On 11. The God said... 14. Uh, God said... 20. Uh, God said... 24. The, Take a wild guess. Uh, God said... God said. Exactly. <laughs> you can see a pattern going yeah. on here? <laughs> what did he use? Knowledge. Knowledge? Not quite. God said... God said... God oh, said... his voice? His voice or his word. Mm. Yeah. That's exactly what he used. Question number three, God could have thought his creation into existence, right? But instead, he spoke it into existence. 
What two things is God teaching us about his word here? That first of all, it is his word. It is his word. But his word is able to do this. His word was able to make all of the, everything that we see, his word is able to create. So that tells us that his word is powerful. It is powerful. And if it can do things like that, that leads us to number two, that we ought to listen to it. Now, question number four, we're going to read Genesis, or I'll have you read Genesis 1 31, um, and then uh, chapter 2, verse 1, and then I'm going to read Exodus 20, verse 11. Go ahead. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. There was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay, the sixth day. And then Exodus 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. How long did it take God to create the universe? Or the world. What did you, what did you read? What did six I read? days. Six, six days. days. Six twenty-four hour days. And Moses, who wrote Genesis, also was the writer of Exodus, and he very clearly, in connection with the whole Sabbath laws, remember, work for six days, rest on the seventh draws a parallel between uh, the Israelite pattern for their weekly lives with God's creating activity in week one. That he worked for six days and then rested on the seventh, not meaning God's like oh, out of breath, tired, but you know, coming to a resting position, that no longer moving, no longer doing what he had been doing. Um, and you notice how he, he pauses after each day to give us an opportunity to marvel at what he has done. And there's a nice order in which he creates things as well. You know, on, if, you were to, if you were to make like the, the creating activity like the, uh, a six-pointed star, the top point up here, light. Okay? Day four, the corresponding point at the bottom. Sun, moon, and stars, the celestial bodies that give off light. Day two would be the, uh, uh, the water or the seas and the sky. Day five, the corresponding point on the other side of the star, would be the animals that uh, are in the air and in the sea, so the birds and the marine light. If you go to day three, God creates vegetation on the land. The corresponding point in the star on the other side is all the land animals. And so there's a, a, a logical order to what God is doing. He basically sets the table before he inhabits the place. Um, and it says everything was perfect. Now if you look at the end of each day, it says God saw all that he had made and it was good. God saw all that he had made and it was good. Through day, uh, from day one through day five. Then he gets to the end of day six, and he said, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. He adds that word very onto it. The difference is this, that at the end of each day, his creation was perfect, but it wasn't complete. When he said very good, now it was both perfect and complete. Getting into some terms here, uh, the word creation is uh, talking about how God created the universe in six 24-hour days from nothing using his word. Now, creation is not the only theory, as you are well aware, of the origins of everything. Uh, the, the common competing one these days in uh, the, the, uh, much of the academic world and in uh, American society and really Western society in general, I guess you could say, would be evolution. 
uh, which is mankind's theory that the universe slowly developed over the course of billions of years. Um, this theory denies that God created everything. In fact, in the, uh, a video that I'll be sharing with you, uh, you'll have the opportunity to hear um, what motivated people to come up with the theory of, of evolution, and it's a, a reaction against God, really, uh, which kind of tells you something about the theory itself. But some people, some Christians, they want to try to pander to the general scientific community these days and to people who, who, who believe these things to try to show, okay, you can be both a Christian uh, and an evolutionist at the same time, and what you have there are what are called uh, what is called theistic evolution. You see that word for God there, the false idea that God created the universe using the process of evolution. And in this case, then they would say that uh, Genesis one is not meant to be a journalistic report of facts. Uh, that it is. Uh, allegorical, that it's symbolic, or, or whatever term you want to use, uh, even though every Hebrew scholar will tell you that Genesis 1 is simple narrative prose, which is always meant to be understood in uh, the, the simple, basic, intended meaning, and not, you know, uh, meant to be understood in a symbolic way. Uh, but what they would say then, uh, these other people, is that the days in Genesis are just representative of really long segments of time. <clears throat> and that kind of leads us then to number five. In an attempt to merge the concept of evolution with the biblical teaching of creation, some people, like I said, say that the days mentioned in Genesis 1 are actually really, really long periods of time. So maybe, like, I think they say right now the latest number that the universe is something like 13.6 billion years old. So each day would probably be, um, if you cut each of them equally, a little over 2 billion years, period. However, the biblical account very clearly shows that such ideas are wrong and that the days in Genesis 1 are actually normal 24-hour days. Take a look for a moment in verses 5, 8, 13, 19, 23, and 31 in Genesis chapter 1. Look how each of them end, and what similarity do you see in each of those passages shows us that we're talking about a normal 24-hour period day here. They all end with day. So they all end with day. How, and how is that day described in each of them? Evening and morning. Evening and morning. What is an evening? It's night. Nighttime. Now, by the way, uh, Jewish reckoning of days, the day actually begins in the evening. So that's why they start with evening. Uh, according to the Jewish mindset, you sleep to work, whereas for a lot of other people, we work to sleep. <laughs> so the day starts in the evening, sun going down. Morning, what is that? The start of the day. Third, the, the sun coming up. What do you notice about the words evening and morning? How many evenings and mornings in each day? One. One. One apiece. So either we're talking about a normal 24-hour-ish period day, or as if each day represents a couple billion years, that must mean that at some point in the past, the Earth's rotation was so slow that w each side of the planet took about a one billion year turn at either facing toward the sun or away from the sun. And once you get vegetation on day or era three, well, what's going to happen to all life that's facing the sun for a couple billion years? It's going to evolve. It's not going to evolve. If you have direct sunlight on the same oh, it's side, it's going to die. Yeah, it's going to become superheated, and everything's going to die off. What about the side facing away from the sun for that long? Wouldn't it also die. 
Exactly. It's also going to die off, and you're going to have a lifeless planet. Uh, what you see there pictured in the packet is an illustration of what would happen to a uh, planet if it is what's called a tidally locked, a tidally locked planet. The moon, for instance, is tidally locked to the Earth. That's why you only see one side of the moon, okay? Because that same side always faces the Earth. If Earth's rotation were slowed down so much that it would take two billion years for it to do a complete, rot a single rotation, essentially it's tidally locked. And the, the illustration there is kind of what happens. You might have a little bit of a Goldilocks zone um, around the edges of the sunlight there, but by and large, everything's going to die off. And of course, eventually that Goldilocks zone is going to shift over time and things there will die off too. So uh, I didn't put the answer down. My apologies, it got caught up. But God emphasizes that there was an evening and a morning to each day. And this tells us, okay, we're talking about a single day here. So to look at the chart then, uh, some quick differences between creation and evolution. Um, creation is God's eyewitness account. Remember, no human being was alive back then, so uh, we have to take God's word for it. Evolution is a human theory. Again, keep in mind, no human was alive back then. And it's a, hu it's a theory that is supposedly based on scientific evidence, although there's a lot of holes there. Uh, creation says that, uh, according to the Bible, that it took place in six days. And one thing to notice, when God created everything, he gave the earth and the, the whole universe age. It was a mature creation. It wasn't like Adam and Eve started off as one cell organisms or the animals as a single cell organisms that had to um, you know, the, um, multiply and whatnot before they became what, you know, they were intended to be. Um, God gave the creation age. You could have stepped out there on day seven and looked at it, and it would have been just like right now. Oh, this has been here for a long time. So God gave creation age. Um, evolution, billions of years. By the way, one interesting thing about uh, um uh, how do they date, how do they figure billions of years? Uh, well, that has to do especially with the light uh, from the most distant stars. I'm not going to get into that, but just taking some of the, the stuff that we see on Earth, you know, they say that these rock layers are millions of years old, or etc. cetera. Um, is radiocarbon really a reliable way of dating things? Well, if you take the, uh, the, the mineral deposits that Mount St. Helens uh, vomited out back in 1980 all over the state of Washington in that area. Well, already by the time it was like 30 years after Mount St. Helens erupted, uh, those mineral samples, the rock samples there, were giving readings, radiocarbon dating readings between 350,000 and 1 million years old. Even though we know it was just laid down 30 years prior. Because um, evolution, the, the, the dates for the aging process require that uh, the way things are now has to be the way things are in the past. That the past and the present, you know, there wasn't anything to accelerate things like a volcanic eruption. Uh, and that's, that's the big problem because we know that that's just not the case. Uh, with creation, Everything created out of nothing. Uh, evolution in regard to biological life came from uh, very primitive cells. And um, I'll talk more about that at another point uh, that I'll refer to. Uh, creation was done by God's word. Evolution, just an uninterrupted chance or process. In creation, humans are special creatures. And we're going to get to that in the next section, part seven. 
Um, whereas in evolution, humans are just highly developed animals. And there's some significant impacts for the Christian faith in these things. But in creation, we are accountable to God. In evolution, we are just the master of our own destinies. Now, evolution, survival of the fittest, you know, uh, survival of the species, the strong eat the weak. You, you've heard of those ideas and principles before. Um, okay, if we came from, from animals, then those principles should apply to us of ensuring that only the strong survive. Get rid of the weak. Kind of like uh, Nazi Germany's Actian T4 program, which systematically eliminated all the old, the infirm, those with uh, physical abnormalities or you know, uh, Down syndrome, all of those, hundreds of thousands of people killed in Germany between 1939 and 1945 under Actian T4. Or how about the Jewish Holocaust? You know, the Jews, they were called the Untermenschen, the Undermen. They weren't as highly evolved. Now, according to evolution, if that's true, that they were the Untermenschen, then, then the Holocaust was a good thing. And that's how the Holocaust was justified in the eyes of Germany. Now, we know that that's just absolutely crap. But it all comes from and stems from evolutionary principles. And there's one of the big problems, as far as society is concerned, with the theory of evolution. And it does, you know, thankfully it doesn't lead everybody down that same path. Not everybody will follow their, their beliefs and their principles here in these things through to their ultimate conclusion. Thank goodness. But if you're consistent, that's where these things do lead. And that is just such a huge, huge glaring issue and problem uh, just on a moral level. Of course, that's another thing um, about, about this. If there is no God, where do the laws come from? If there is no God, who gets the, to say what is right and what is wrong? And what gives you the right the, or the authority to tell me what is right or wrong, or vice versa? Who gets that power? Morality has to come from a higher authority or source than us. It has to come from God. But if there is no God, well, then there are no rules. There's no moral accountability. And there are some atheists who will be consistent and hold to that. Now, what's interesting about some of the world's uh, most prominent atheists, and I forgot to mention this earlier when that term came up, when you look at their past, a lot of them have issues, baggage, in regard to their earthly father. That dad was absent, that dad maybe died prematurely and left them uh, without a father, that dad was abusive in some sort of way or a poor role model. A lot of them have daddy issues or what uh, some psychologists call the father wound. In fact, um, one time talking with uh, a lady that I used to bowl with, and uh, she was talking about her... Uh, I think it was her uncle, and how her uncle was just so hostile toward God or the idea of God. And, and I asked, you know, what was his relationship with his father like? And I don't remember exactly what she said, but I do remember that it was junk. And I said, well, that probably explains a lot. They have some sort of uh, issues with the relationship with their earthly father it increases their chances that they're going to have issues with their Heavenly Father as well. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty sad when you, when you look at that and see that, especially because of how, how great our Heavenly Father is. Okay, uh, reading the bold type next to the chart in your packet, although there are significant gaps in the theory of evolution, and a Christian will want to take note of them and point them out at the appropriate time. 
Science never, ever proves the Bible correct. Oh, that frustrates me so much when Christian scientists will say, yep, the si science proves the Bible. No, it does not. Even there are even sources that I find beneficial and share a lot of, of useful information with that will come off sometimes and say science proves the Bible right. No, it doesn't. It does not. We can say that science supports the creation model better than the evolutionary one, but we dare not say that science proves the Bible correct. Remember Hebrews 11, verse 3. It says, By faith we know that the universe was created by God's word. For more on the theory of evolution, uh, you're invited to watch a couple of supplemental videos that I prepared for uh, the grade school catechism classes, which will touch on some of the subject I was, subjects I was hinting at and alluding to a little bit ago. Uh, but those videos are going to explore, number one, the historical background of the theory of evolution. Number two, some, but by no means all, the examples of how the theory of evolution does not fit with what we observe in nature. You know, people present it this way. Uh, uh, science has proven that evolution is true. Far, far from it. There are so many uh, gaping holes in the theory of evolution. So many things that science uh, actually says that throw the theory of evolution into complete doubt and uncertainty. But most importantly, number three, how the theory of evolution is not only incompatible with the Bible, but it even nullifies the need for Jesus. And that one really shines through in the second video that I will share. Any questions or comments at all? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, part seven, then looking at mankind, the crown of God's creation. Uh, the first question says, read chapters 1, verses 3, 6, 9, and 14. We don't need to get into those again. That's all the, and God said, let there be this, and there was that, and God said. Um, what we're going to notice when we read chapter 2, verse 7, is a difference in how God created man from how he created everything else. Okay? Let's, let's read that, and then I'll keep reading the question here. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. All right, and then 21 and 22 get into the formation of Eve. But we see that God slowed down here and didn't just use his word. He formed mankind slowly and carefully from the dust of the earth. What comforting fact does that contrast show us? Everything else he just said, let there be, and there was. This, now he's taking his time. What does that show us about us? That he truly cares about us. Yeah, thus that we are his special creatures. Yeah, you don't, if you don't really, or if you don't care as much about something, you're not going to put as much effort into it. Now, that's not to say that God doesn't care about his creation, because, I mean, he just made it in such a splendid way. But that's, but this contrast is, uh, stated to underscore and emphasize just how special humans are. If creation is special to God, how much more if he did this for us? Continuing with the bold sentence there, uh, we were created in the image of God, but we lost it in sin. The following passages help define the image of God. Colossians 3, verse 10. Read that, please. Put on the new self, which is continually being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. All right. The new self, renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. So a knowledge that is in keeping with God's image. Romans 8. Because those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4. In the case of those people, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from clearly seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is God's image. And then Ephesians 4. Put on the new self, which has been created to be like God in righteousness and true holiness. 
And so when we look at these passages here, what really becomes immediately clear is that this image of God has absolutely nothing to do with our physical appearance at all. It can't. God doesn't have a body. He's a spirit, remember. Uh, it has to do with our, our character, our, our moral uh, character and nature. And um, it's within that framework that we hear uh, that we are created to be like God and, that, and thus, after coming to faith in Christ, renewed or being renewed in the knowledge of the image of our Creator. Uh, so then getting to that term, the image of God, it's uh, that mankind was created to be holy and without sin. We knew God's will perfectly. We wanted what God wants. We lived in perfect harmony with God. But this image was lost with the fall into sin. And because I love Calvin and Hobbes, I couldn't resist having a little Calvin and Hobbes there. You're young, but are you familiar with Calvin and Hobbes? Yeah. Good. You're, you're a good cultured man. Um, yeah. Gotta love Calvin and Hobbes. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, some of the things that I said when I was a kid reminded my uncle of Calvin, so he would call me Calvin. I even have a um, framed a particular Calvin and Hobbes comic in my uh, house. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Number three, you can fill in the blanks as we go along. When God created Adam and Eve, he declared that they were good. This means that even before they had done anything, they were good. That was their nature. However, God wanted to give Adam and Eve a way to put this passive goodness into action. He wanted them to be more than puppets or marionettes. He wanted them to be holy by choice, not just by design. In the middle of the Garden of Eden, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God commanded them not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave them this command as a way to express their love and thanks to God. And Martin Luther has a really cool quote about this tree here. He said that this tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Adam's church, his altar, his pulpit. Here he was to yield to God the obedience he owed, to give recognition to the word and will of God, to give thanks to God, and to call upon God for aid against temptation. And had Adam and Eve resisted the temptation to eat from this tree, it's likely that they would have eventually been confirmed in their holiness, and, um, well, things would be much different today. Um, but they didn't, and that'll be the subject of the next lesson. But this gets us into the whole concept of free will, uh, which is the ability to choose to do right or wrong. And that was how God created Adam and Eve. But um, free will was actually lost in the fall into sin. I, a lot of people don't recognize that because they're working with the wrong definition or understanding of free will. When they think of free will, they think, okay, am I going to choose between Cinnamon Toast Crunch or Lucky Charms? Both good choices, but Cinnamon Toast Crunch is really the right one. So, And most people recognize that. Just kidding. Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Lucky Charms, that's not a matter for God's courtroom. You're free to do whatever you want. There's a lot of those sorts of choices in life where they're neither inherently good nor bad. Uh, maybe some might be better, some might be wiser than others. Can't really say that Lucky Charms or Cinnamon Toast Crunch, one is wiser than the other, whatever. But um, they're not right or wrong. Maybe at worst smart or dumb, but not right or wrong. What we're talking about here with free will is the ability to choose to do right or wrong, and not just the outward obedience to the law. And we're going to get to that more when we talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. What's really being, you know, with what, what's really being talked about here is the heart from which flows the motives for the things that we do, whether they are outwardly right or wrong. Because as we know, 
We can do the right things for the wrong reasons. Or for selfish, self-interested reasons. We can certainly do that. You know, some guy could give a married woman a nice bouquet of flowers, but he's not married to her, in an effort to woo her and win her affection. He's doing something nice outwardly, but the motive is absolutely wrong. And we'll look more at uh, motives and whatnot when we get to that point. But getting back to Genesis chapter 1, um, read verse 28, please. God blessed them and said to them, Be, uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gives mankind authority and dominion over the earth. What does this mean? Or, I'm sorry, does this mean that we have the right to harm the environment? Of course not. Yeah, we are uh, what we would call stewards or caretakers of this world. Uh, Christians are going to want to find the proper balance between trashing the world and worshiping it. Um, yes, we want to uh, value and respect God's creation. But what's interesting is when you look at some uh, unbelievers, they are so fanatical about uh, caring for the environment. And on the surface, hey, good thing, you know, I, I, I respect that, I'm on board with that. But there's a, an underlying motive in it. For some, it's because maybe like some of the Native Americans, they actually worship the land, which is wrong. For others, it's because, well, for them, they believe this world is all that there is for their existence. And so, you know, let's pin our hopes and our dreams in this world. And that's why they, get, they fight so vigorously for it. Uh, that's the underlying motive and current in doing those things. Uh, and, and we need to be aware of that and recognize that as God's people. Uh, but just because those two are wrong doesn't mean that we should be reckless or careless about the environment either. We have to be the stewards or the caretakers of things. And uh, people talk about all oh, global warming and, and whatnot. And, and yeah, you know, humans need to be cautious not to play a great role in that, but um, we also have to understand and recognize what, what's been going on with this planet for the last uh, four or five thousand or more years. And that is that the world has been continuing to still recover from the last ice age. Uh, when when uh, Noah, you know, Noah and, and, and the ark you had the rains for 40 days, 40 nights that rose to just a little bit higher than the tallest mountains, at least the tallest mountains at the time. Uh, well, the water that came did not just come down from the heavens. It also came up from the earth below. And that water that came up from the earth below is superheated and hot because, you know, underneath the earth's surface. So you have all this this superheated water, and water that's really hot, what's it going to ultimately do? Evaporate. Evaporate, right? Which is going to lead to lots of rain, lots of snow. There's your ice age. Right after the time of the ark. And so we are still experiencing the, uh, the recovery process from the flood, from the ice age that was triggered by the flood. Now, when you have a big block of ice, it takes quite a while for it to melt, right? But as it starts melting and gets the surface area gets smaller, that melting process starts to speed up, doesn't it? And then faster and faster, especially as the room gets warmer and warmer then, because there's not as much ice to cool things down. Think of the glaciers. We've been seeing, yes, the uh, melting of the glaciers, and it's starting to happen faster and faster. Well, why is that? Because there's less and less 
and the earth is then subsequently getting warmer and warmer, and there's other factors that will help to contribute to that warming process too. So uh, it's just a new norm is what it is. Take a look at verse 27 and read it, please. God created the man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So what two genders or sexes did God create? Male and female. Male and female. And question number six, what two factors determine whether one is a male uh, or a female? The first one is reproductive. reproductive organs. And the second one would be genetics or DNA. A couple of things there. You know, you got this whole issue with transgender these days of, of men identifying as women and to a lesser extent women are... Uh, I, I shouldn't say that. Uh, then you have women trying to identify as men. Take Bruce Jenner, for example. Um, now he calls himself Caitlyn Jenner, I think. Let's say Bruce Jenner, I'm going to call him Bruce because he is a man, commits a crime. His blood is at the scene of the crime. Who are the cops going to be looking for, a man or a woman? Man. Because the DNA says he's a man. What we're talking about here is gender dysphoria, which I, I certainly don't want to minimize it. It is, it is a mental illness, and you, you absolutely want to show sympathy and compassion for somebody. And I remember my very first experience with a gender a person who uh, had... Uh, gender dysphoria, and I was a teenage boy. It wasn't, you know, common uh, to to see it and experience it uh, back in the 1990s. And so, as a result, just being my immature teenage self, I was all giggly about it. Didn't help that um, it was a very poorly presented job. I mean, it was very clearly a dude dressed as a chick. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I was scanning this person's groceries, working at the grocery store, and I'm just laughing the whole time, and the bagger was a, uh, he wasn't in, we didn't go to the same high school, but we were, we would have been classmates. Uh, we played soccer a little bit growing up with each other. He's just kind of busting a gut laughing too. Wish I wouldn't have done that. It's hard for a person, you know, they, they struggle with that. Um, but it's a dysphoria. In many respects, much like anorexia. Anorexia nervosa, you know what anorexia is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And um, anorexia is a, a mental disorder where the mind's perception of the body does not match with the reality. And so the person could think that they are you know, just ridiculously fat and obese, and they look like they're starved and emaciated. But because of that perception, they say, I can't eat, i got to lose weight. Now, what's the way to treat that? Is the proper way to treat that to enable the behavior by continuing to starve? Or is it to uh, try to, to treat the mental illness? Obviously, it's to treat the mental illness. Well, gender dysphoria is the same thing. You don't treat the mind by mutilating the body. And there are so many instances out there and so much documentation, even from, in some cases, liberal news media outlets that talk about this, that um, uh, the, the irreparable harm and damage that is, is caused. Uh, Matt Walsh, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says, but he did uh, a, a really good piece uh, about, uh, it's called, I think, What is a Woman? And he just goes around and was honestly exploring and asking that question. And people refusing to give him a straightforward, honest answer. Now, is this to say that there aren't, you know, we believe in a gender binary, male and female. Now, is that to say that there are no people that have like XXY or XYY chromosomes or uh, people who display physically uh, both the male and female 
um, reproductive attributes? Of course not. The, the, those sorts of people do exist, um, but one, those are the exceptions to the rule, the very rare exceptions, uh, and two, that is something different than gender dysphoria. Uh, and again, you treat those people with love and compassion and support them. Now there's a whole lot more that you know could be said about this subject and if anybody has any questions or whatever regarding it, uh, not just you but for people watching video in the future, whatever, um, you know, just please feel free to talk with me about this. But um, yeah, there, you show care for the person by treating the heart and source of the illness, and that is, it, it is a mental illness. So uh, that's all I'm going to say about it uh, for right now. Shifting gears now into God's providential care. A couple of passages there. Could you read Colossians 1? For in Christ all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and unseen, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and all things hold together in him. All things hold together in him. And then Acts 17, For in God we live and move and have our being. I mean, just think about you know these passages, the illustrations you see on the screen and in your packet, and how, how comforting these things are. Because the Big Bang says that we're just cosmic accidents, really. Uh, it's random, there's no purpose, no meaning, no inherent value. All those things, purpose, meaning, and value, are found in God, are wrapped up in Him. Uh, and not only did He create us, but our continued existence, as it says in these passages, uh, depend on His continued goodness. And so, really, then, it is in God that we continue to find our highest joy and delight and fulfillment. And we really see that, then, in the Bible. Now, getting to question number one, uh, we'll look at the passages second here. Uh, just skipping past the passages for a moment. Uh, but, uh, in what two ways does God supply us with our general needs? Uh, John 6, verses 1 to 13 just a summary there, it's uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000 by creating food, uh, enough food for everyone to eat from uh, two small fish and five loaves of bread. Uh, this is obviously what we would call, uh, in the first blank there for number one, a miracle. So he, can, he does it by miracles or supernatural acts, acts that go beyond the natural laws. And he does this when he wishes. Now, how do we define a miracle? Can God even work miracles through natural acts? Such as when uh, God brought quail into the Israelite camp in the Old Testament. That could have been a natural event, but it was obviously out of the ordinary. Very, very, very much so. And you know, God may have guided and directed that just insane amount of quail to, to come and land there. So, natural means, but God working a miracle through natural means. However, miracles aren't the normal way that God operates. Uh, Acts 14, verse 17 says, Yet God did not leave himself without testimony of the good he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He fills you with food and fills your heart with gladness. So, Rain comes down, crops grow. This is the natural order of things. And so, letter B, he normally provides for us by natural means, using the things that he created. Now, some groups will refuse medical services because they say it goes against their religion. So, for example, um, their child has cancer and... They say, nope, I am refusing a blood transfusion or whatever for this kid who is in need of it. If God wants him to get better, he will get better. All I have to do is just believe. And if I believe strong enough, he will do it. So it's called faith healing. Of course, then when the healing doesn't happen, 
such groups will always have their ready-made explanation. Well, guess what? You didn't believe hard enough. You didn't trust him enough, causing people to doubt and question their faith. But all of this is a sin called presumption. When you act, expect God to act contrary to the way that he normally does, and how he normally works through natural means, such as medicine. That is called presumption, when you expect him to do a miracle. In fact, the devil even tried to get Jesus to fall into this very sin. He said, you know what? If you are the Son of God, throw yourself over this cliff here, because it, the scriptures say that God will command his angels guarding you, uh, and they will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus uh, fires one, another passage back at him and says, it also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. My illustration about the, the kid with cancer and the parents who say, nope, not going to do anything, we're going to trust God, they're putting the Lord their God to the test. Uh, early on during COVID, I met a lady at uh, the Walmart in, in Wisconsin. I had known her for many years. Uh, she went to the church where I was a vicar at, her student pastor. And, um, you know, I'm not going to get into the wisdom or right or wrongness about wearing masks, uh, but she said that she refused to wear masks because, you know, if, if God um, doesn't want her to get sick, all she needs to do is believe and she won't get sick. Now, I, you know, okay, you can have an argument about whether or not masks were effective or not. I'm, I'm not going to go there, but her whole principle was flawed. That she expected, if you trust in God, he's going to keep you safe from getting sick. That's not necessarily the case. That is sinful presumption. And, uh, and so, uh, unfortunately, God's people will fall into that at times. Don't expect God to do a miracle. Can we pray for a miracle? Absolutely. Does God still do miracles today? I am 100% convinced he does. Sometimes, maybe even through the natural order of things. But... We should never, ever expect him to do one. Let's read the next few passages there. Uh, Psalm ninety-one, eleven. Yes, he will give a command to his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. Okay, and then Hebrews uh, 1, 14. Are not all angels, ministering spirits, sent out to serve for the benefit of those who are going to inherit salvation? So they're, the angels... They're to guard us, they're to serve those who inherit salvation, meaning God's people, Christians. And then Revelation 5.11. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. All right, so according to the italicized portions who are the unique creations God uses, obviously angels. Uh, the angels... Uh, they are uh, God's messengers. The word angelus from the Greek means messenger, whom he sends to take care of us and sometimes share his messages uh, with us. And uh, they are spirit beings. They do not possess a physical body. And I think it's very comforting to know that there are thousands upon ten thousands of angels out there. There's a lot of them around. Uh, read Matthew 22, please. In fact, in the resurrection, people neither marry nor are given in marriage. Instead, they are like the angels of God in heaven. So looking at that passage, do we become angels when we die? No. No, it says like the angels. It doesn't say we become angels. Like in the sense that they are holy. Um, when we look at these passages here, we notice a number of things about angels. Uh, that they are, first of all, lower in rank because they're sent to serve us. Uh, number two, uh, if you go back to Genesis, we don't see, well, actually, we don't hear about God creating the angels at all. Uh, scripture is silent on when they were created. But we don't hear about them being created in a special way, which uh, shows us something about their rank. And third, um, Bear in mind, Jesus did not come to save angels, the fallen angels, the devil and the demons. 
He came to save humans. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Last passage, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So number four, God promises to take even the evil or bad things that happen to us and use them to serve our eternal good. And it's so amazing when you look through Bible history, uh, and even in our own lives, and see how God took some of the, the, the bad things in this world and used them to serve our good. Look what he did with Jesus. The horrible injustice that was done to Jesus. And, well, through that, God paid for the sins of the whole world. Perhaps one of the greatest stories outside of Jesus is the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Um, Jacob's son, Joseph, and how God worked through the horrible things that Joseph endured uh, through many, many years to ultimately uh, bring about the safety and salvation of countless thousands of people. And really, when you think about it, uh, the salvation of even us. Because through all of that, God protected the line of the Savior so that the Savior could be born. And so we have this wonderful promise of God's providential care and protection. Any questions at all? All right. Uh, that's it for tonight. You've got the uh, worksheet for next time. We'll close with a blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with us all. Amen. All right. Have a good night. Thank you, too.